big enough, or it's, it's just barely big enough for, for some circumstances. But for most of it, it's, it's not good enough. Uh, and then what will happen is, that's the, the scattering experiment that you see in the subway alluded to uh, when you go to the U6, there is the Bragg reflection, and that ultimately is exactly the Bragg reflection. Uh, if you look at the subway going out to Munich, you may have seen the Bragg law, uh, and that ultimately is exactly what you do here. You, you look at the scattering of atoms, okay? So the atoms in a consistent way scatter the X-ray beams. Now consistent comes simply because you have the same repeated and repeated. And that gives this consistent pattern. That gives an electron density. And this electron density, so essentially the probability for the electron, where you find the electrons. Uh, and from this electron density, you have to compute a 3D structure. Uh, to compute means essentially you see a cloud, a cloud is probability for an electron, and into this cloud, you have to fit the resin. Okay? Clear? So you essentially have to develop a computer algorithm that tries several orientations and moves them around and then optimizes the fit of the cloud. So it's essentially you, of the atom you see only the electron cloud, the electron density cloud. And since each amino acid has a different shape, you expect a different cloud. You see a cloud and you have to fit this amino acid that you expect at that position into that cloud, it doesn't fit, you move on in the sequence. Because you don't, you see a cloud, you don't know which residue is at which place. And that you simply have to try out. Okay? But it is relatively simple in the sense that there are many alternatives. And a lot of that uh, historically has been done manually uh, by experts. Only now people have really methods that do it fairly completely automatically. Only the final step is still manual. Uh, but it's relatively straightforward. Uh, relatively straightforward is this is a process that today is doable. Once you have the diffraction pattern, once you have the electron cloud, you ultimately have the three-dimensional structures within days. Okay? That's as easy as that is. Getting to the point where you have the diffraction, again, that typically sort of takes a year, uh, more than a year, to, to that point. Once you have the beam time, uh, from the beam time to the moment, if you have a good crystal from the beam time to the moment where you have a structure for the structures where control. Yes? Can we repeat the step to the electron density map? So the electron density map, so again, the electron density map is originating from the scattering of the uh, X-ray beams in, a, in the same way of different parts of this on the lattice. Every atom in the lattice that is the same residue or the same atom has the same shape, so it reflect, reflects the light in the same way. And that you can compute into a Fourier transform into an electron density. Okay, so now we have an electron density map. And again, the electron density map is the probability for where the electrons are. Now, you have the electron density map for an entire protein of, say, 100 residues. And in this protein of 100 residues, this particular cloud that you see, uh, I have to admit, I cannot see what, what, the re what, what, what I see here. Uh, but say, this particular residue that I see here would be uh, an L, okay? So, in my protein of 100 residues, I have several Ls. So I have to fit the first L, and the first L in my sequence is maybe followed by a V. So then I would have to see, is the next part of this electron density map, does it fit to a V? If not, then I try another L. So I move through my V sequence until I find an L that fits here. And that fits such that the next sequence in my, uh, the next residue in my sequence, the V fits into the next electron density map, either in this direction or flip it around, right? So essentially, I start somewhere, and then I sort of dive through the possibility. Is that clear? And essentially, really fit means a visual fit, or uh, an optimal fit in terms of density, because, again, the residue implies a movement of the electron. So if you know the, the residue, you know, essentially, where the electron density will be, because you know the atoms, right? You know how each amino acid is shaped, okay? It's a shape mesh problem, ultimately. It's not 
as simple as I say it, because, and I'll get to back, back to that in a minute, uh, because you have this issue that the electron density that may not be accurate enough to have a clear fit for putting that. I, I will show you. Uh, anyway, so that is the most common way to determine protein structures. Uh, it is expensive because it takes a lot of time. And it's expensive because it is a, a huge X-ray producing machine. In fact, in the US, the large X-ray facilities at some point uh, in 2000, around 2010, were mostly occupied. So these large uh, X-ray machines that are used for physics experiments were mostly used for protein crystallography. Uh, that was sort of the major CERN. It's still mostly used for physics but does by now also a lot of this work. Uh, so, in, in you all most likely, does everybody in the room know what's, what CERN is? So these are these large, so it's under Geneva, the, the first common European research center in Europe, uh, started in the 50s, but essentially it's high energy physics, looking at sort of the, the molecular structure underneath uh, the core elements that we know, the so protons and electrons, uh, that's where we know antimatter from, that's where, where many, many, many things are coming from. And essentially the ring that accelerates particles there at this point, I believe, is over 50 kilometers long. Uh, it's Geneva, and much more than Geneva at this point, and it's all under the mountain because it has to be shielded from radiation. So really it's a, it's a very advanced and expensive machinery. There was a question. Uh, so you said that getting a crystal is not easy for yes. the majority of the proteins, but here it says that 90% of them are done by x-rays? So yes, so uh, let's get back to these numbers. Uh, I said that there are 120,000 proteins in the PDB, for which we know the three-dimensional structures. 90% of those are done by x-ray crystallography. Uh, but 120, so we, I also told you we have 111 million proteins that we have, okay? So 120,000 is, is much smaller than 111 million. And that ultimately is because for most it's not that easy. Uh, okay, now we get to the next technology. The next technology begins with something that is NMR spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, so roughly at this point 10% of all the structures. Uh, the beauty is you take the protein out of its natural environment, solvent, you put it in a tube, and you put the tube into a magnet. You don't do any manipulation. So you're not growing a crystal, you're not changing anything, you just take the protein in its native environment. Okay? That's the beauty of it. Uh, and then from here on things get a little bit more complicated. Uh, again, there is something about size. So this is a photo from the City College, New York, the New York Structural Biology Center. Uh, so that is a so-called 900 megahertz machine. You see that's a person up there. Uh, these machines are such that uh, if anything that is like a credit card would be making this photo, or if you have anything on you like a credit card making this photo, then you don't have to worry about credit anymore after that. Uh, it's all completely white. So coming close, in, you, it, this photo is not what I mean. Just coming into this room, everything is lost. Uh, that, that you have in any, so these magnets are extremely large. In fact, to shield this room, uh, this machinery is big, but the most important part of the price was shielding the room. In fact, uh, shielding and, and providing the room in the right way. Anyway, so by now, this machine here is, is by far not no longer the biggest thing they have. Uh, so this is, today is considered sort of a, a machine for a small lab. In fact, there are machines such as this, standing at Hamels and, and here, in the, uh, here on the campus, uh, not named like 900, the 800, right? The largest 800. Uh, but the, the, the larger machines are even bigger. Again, immensely big magnets, but that's not the major problem. The major problem really is that we, what you essentially get is you see a correlation of protons. And from this correlation of protons, you have to compute which residues are in close to each other. And 
that is highly complicated. Highly complicated means you can essentially not, in this particular case, distinguish between they being at position 5 being in contact to, to some, some other uh, leucine or veiling as position 15. And the only way you can do it is that if you assume this is a 5 in front of you, you get a certain model, and then you see whether that, that model is sort of compatible with all the other constraints you have. And what you show you here is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20 different models, roughly, right? 20 different models that are all com equally well compatible with the data. Okay? Now, there are two ways of reading this. So essentially what I show you with these beams or with these different lines here, each of these now is a protein structure, or each one of these depends on how you want to look at it. Each one of these is a model for how the actual 3D structure looks. And there are two ways to read it, I said. One is now, we cannot decide which one is right because our experiment is not good enough. Right? That's one way of looking at it. Uh, another way of looking at it is that, in fact, where we see movement, so where we see differences between these 16, so here you see a lot of difference, here you see that all 16 essentially are at the same place in 3D. They all come together. So maybe that implies, somebody on Tuesday talked about the B factors. Maybe this is exactly what we see here. It was you. Uh, so maybe the B factor, here the B factor is such that the thing is not moving, and here the B factors are uh, such that in fact movement is there. Okay? So maybe what I see in NMR is in fact the dynamic of a process. And this is an old fight between NMR spectroscopist and extra crystallographers. Crystallographers say, you guys just can't do real structures. And the mass spectroscopists say, well, what we show is motion. And you guys don't see that in your crystals because it's sort of blocked in the crystal conformation. Uh, and there, there is evidence for both of those have, have some points. Uh, so NMR does show dynamics in a way in which crystallography cannot as easily show it. That's clear. And NMR is also more challenging, which means that it makes more mistakes. It's also, the point I said, the moment you have a crystal in crystallography, to the point that you get a 3D structure, I said it's days. The moment you have the experimental data here, to the point of getting the structure is many months. And this is many months for an expert. So an expert is defined as somebody who has been trained in the field for five or more years. Uh, so it's, it's, it's totally expert driven not easy uh, to make it fit. So there are computer programs from the early days, and this is a field that is very open to computer programs because they are theoretical physicists. Uh, it's true for, for, for extra crystallography as well. But anyway, so NMR is in this sense more challenging. Just one final step before I come to your question. Uh, the next challenge is that since you do not know is it evading at position 10 or 15, the problem gets worse the longer the protein. That means that NMR can actually not handle proteins longer than 200 residues. Most human proteins are much longer than that. So that's another constraint. Um, and they clearly cannot sort of look at proteins interacting with each other because together they would be more than 200 residues. Your question? Um, if you have a protein uh, which was secret by uh, your X-ray crystallography, so there are, again, uh, there was an effort in the, U in the U.S. from 2000 to 2015 called structural genomics. And the idea was to see how much of this technology can we do such that it will become a pipeline. That was one goal. Another goal was do a structure for sort of all the proteins that are unknown out there. How many would we have to do? Another goal was Let's just see whether we can cut the price by automation. Cut the price from $1 million to 100000 In fact, the project succeeded entirely. So they cut the price from $1 million to 100000 uh, this, pro this project, by the way, the structural economics, there was a large investment of money in order to cut the price for all the future. Uh, so it was a big investment. So that is several billion dollars. 
Uh, and in that context, people did exactly this experiment that you said. Uh, and in fact, Guy Montagnone, who does not happen to uh, be on this slide and is also not behind any of the work here, but he's a, an MR spectroscopist and he was leading one of these consortia. So they set 100 proteins aside and asked for how many of these 100 proteins they tried both, a crystallography and an MR spectroscopy. And before they put on these 100, people had always answered whenever you can do extra crystallography, or when, then, then you get, also get an NMR structure and vice versa. Not, not everything that you get an NMR structure for, you get a crystal, but uh, what they showed is that for about a third, you get both. For a third, you get only crystal, and for one other third, you get only NMR. So there is clearly an orthogonal window. So there are many proteins for which only at this point NMR has found a solution. And there are many, many more for which only crystallography has found a solution. But it is so many more for crystallography because those are typically longer and more complex protein-protein interaction kind of cases, larger machines. Uh, but in this case, I already said for the same 100, right? So there's a lot about length. Uh, so those were short ones. Those were all such that looking at the sequence, we would have assumed that they are amenable to NMR. So they were all. So single domain proteins, I can't remember, they're always shorter than 100, but 100 something, 150 or something like that. And even then, uh, there is an orthogonality, which was not known before. Any other questions? Yes? If they get to these 20 different possibilities, do they all insert them into the EDD? Yes. So uh, how would you do it, right? Uh, if you're the experimentalist, and now you have to make a decision, which one is right? How would you do it? So one answer is you select all 20. In fact, that is the, uh, the answer that is shown, uh, that is chosen. Uh, and but the answer, this answer is chosen because of let's call it chickening out. Because if you make a decision, you sort of reduce the experimental result. You know. And as long as you believe that there is an information in the dynamics of the, about the dynamics in the variety, you want to put them all in. But what else could you do? So if those were your 20, how could you choose, yeah? Well, could you somehow like average them so that we could have... Exactly, you could imagine that you sort of look at a RMSD kind of average, and then you pick the one that is, so the average itself is a theoretical construct, right? But you could choose the one of the 20 that is closest to the average. That would be one way. In fact, many people, just a sec, uh, I will get to a secondary structure assignment briefly today, uh, when you assign secondary structure, when you use PDP structure, most people simply use the first model because they never realize that there are 20 in there. Uh, and that, in fact, is what many NMR spectroscopists in the beginning also did because of some, some issues with the database. They simply put the first model down. Yeah? So in the numbers up there, these 20 count as one? No, yeah, yeah, yeah 20 count as one. So this 9% of, of all the structures. Yes? Uh, why can't we have a problem if the protein is smaller than after the recipes? So the, it, it, essentially, essentially the problem is that so here you have the same types of residues and you get proton couplings and proton couplings do not really spell, you say these are two large uh, lysines uh, uh, and yeah, the, the proton couplings do not quite get you the lysine. But assume that we're getting relatively close to the lysine. Uh, now the issue is these, these lysine, lysine uh, can somebody give me a third hand? Uh, so this lysine binds to some other part, right? And my question is, is it this, this one here or is it that one? Okay? I have to take that apart. In order to set up, take these two apart, I essentially have to create more data. The more license I simply have in my protein, or the more repetitions, the more additional data I have to get. And at some point, the whole story gets so complicated that it's no longer, also the, the, the mistake grows faster. At some point, the mistake overgrows your signal. And that is roughly about 200. You can sort of squeeze a little bit and do a little bit of tricks, get a little bit larger, but that's sort of the whole part. Simon 
Okay, so then we get into the next method, and in fact, this number here is, was true a year ago, but this is the fastest growing electron microscopy, uh, the fastest growing in terms of the sense, in the sense that uh, I've been mean, five or ten years, the fraction here will be much higher than one percent. Uh, but the downside to it, and this essentially what you do is, there's no image of it, of it really, uh, you essentially take the protein, you freeze it, and you look at it in an electron microscope. You look at it with an electron microscope. That is totally great. What is not so great is what you see. Uh, so some of these, essentially this is one particular protein here uh, called Royal. Uh, and the best resolution here for Angstrom, you see this level of detail at the worst resolution, and again, some of, many of these 1,000 are more on that side here. What you see is, a, is sort of a, uh, some, some idea about how the surface looks. It really does not get you into how does this thing look inside. It really does not give you in detail the three-dimensional structure in that sense, right? It gives you some idea about the surface but it does not look inside, okay? Again, so the more higher resolution you have, the more you sort of see holes. From these holes you see more details. And now you can imagine that into these details, you can actually model something. So these are the things you see, the outside, and then you simply try different models and ask, do these different models of the detailed three-dimensional structure that you sort of predict given these experimental constraints. So you're not really predicting structure from sequence, but you're predicting structure from sequence that fit it into something where you know how the surface looks. And that, in fact, is, is what people do here. Uh, it's, it's one paper of that, uh, David Baker, uh, Andre Charlie. So I will talk about Andre Charlie in a moment. Uh, they, they essentially do these kind of things. Briefly, yes. What do you do if you have two models that are both fit into the measurements? So the question is, what if you had two different models that fit into the same data? So ultimately, you're looking for alternative data points that tell you, that allow you to choose between the two. Yeah. So it's very hand fit. So every single time that somebody fits a model in, so they, they, they develop methods, but then ultimately, every single time it's achieved on one particular part, that's a publication. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it possible that the two models could fit into one, so like the two uh, left models could fit into one continuous structure? Like yeah, but then, oh, but, but is, isn't that the question? No, he's, 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 he's asking if like this one protein and then you have two different models and they are close to two different models. I'm asking if there are two proteins and there's, we have the same. Ah. Can two different proteins have the same surface? Yes, that's absolutely true. They can. Yeah, the life is not that simple. Uh, and in fact, the reason why two different proteins can have the same, at least part of the surface, can be very similar, or the part of the surface that you could see could be similar between two different proteins, because, in fact, surface is another aspect of what is most important for function. So I said structure determines function. True. Uh, but most of what in order of function typically is to interact with something. And interact with something is typically, and I realize now I, I, the, the, uh, the camera is here, uh, but the microphone is not on me. Um, let's see whether the, the, the lecture helps you a lot. Um, so, uh, so what you see in function most is the surface, and since you see most the surface, another protein may adopt this or may do a similar function with a similar surface. And underneath, things are slightly different, or very, very different. Both is possible. Uh, okay, so now we get into this issue of resolution. So I said you have to fit it into the electron density map. What I show here is at three and oops. Maybe it's a little bit better now. Uh, can you see the blue at all? Okay, so for those of you who cannot see blue, 
there are blue clouds here on these uh, images and these blue clouds in fact are the electron density maps and they are at three different resolutions one that's the highest the best resolution two 2.7 and three it's the lowest what you can s possibly see is there's a ring here and this ring in three at three angstrom resolution you have alternative ways of putting this ring you could easily twist it around completely somehow compatible with the electron density when you have an electron density of one angstrom such as here there's only one orientation of the ring that fits there's only one way to put the ring in because the electron density is so detailed that there's only one solution uh, I can't remember there was somebody somebody here asked the question uh, you asked the question how to do from electron density again so in a case like this one here you just have one fit and, and then you don't have many alternatives right in a case like this in fact what I described as an algorithm is not as simple now on the scale of what we have I said 90% are crystal structures many of them are on that scale very 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 few are on that scale this is becoming more common now okay uh, now this is the way you determine three-dimensional structure let's begin with the simplest, simplest way of determining uh, or aspect of, of structure that is simple is secondary structure secondary structure is stabilized by hydrogen bonds so what it means is in this helix here you have hydrogen bonds forming between residue I and I plus 4 I or oh, let, let, let's go whoops I and I plus 4 so the helix goes around and you have bondings to uh, resi hydrogen bonds to the residue that is 4 away from you and that's a rep repetitive pattern right and the beta strand you have two strands one two that may be far away in sequence but they are then bound such that every second one has a hydrogen bond okay so one there's the second and so forth um, now this is exactly the kind of pattern that I showed you is you may not see it here but here it becomes very clear red the helices yellow the beta strands here is a cartoon where the helix is simply the rod is still the same thing the first structure was in fact determined uh, I'm, I'm sorry uh, Pauling got the Nobel Prize in 1954 for the idea that secondary structure is determined by hydrogen bonds uh, what do you believe when was the first structure then by the way Pauling is also Linus Pauling is also one of those people who got more than one he got two Nobel Prizes one for peace he stopped the testing of atomic bombs surface on the surface or oh, he, he sort of started the movement that stopped it and got another Nobel Prize for that anyway um, does anybody in the room know Linus Pauling for anything else uh, he was the one who completely favored this idea that vitamin C is good for your health uh, again it was it started with Linus Pauling so he, he was the uh, first who on a grand scale advertised eat vitamin C uh, take a lot of it anyway so what do you believe he got the Nobel Prize for the showing or for making or for, for coming up with this idea that hydrogen for hydrogen bond formation determines secondary structure secondary structure is a sort of revealing element of 3d structure so this Nobel Prize was in 54 when was the first structure and obviously right so the answer is not before 54 uh, otherwise it would be boring so uh, if I, I need to find ways to wake you up uh, I need to put breaks somehow in I don't know how uh, so you were supposed to say before 54 uh, and that is not the answer in fact there are two uh, structures from Max Parrots uh, and John Kendrew uh, two proteins myoglobin and hemoglobin so this is 1960 and that is 1958 uh, those are again two Nobel Prizes and those are the first two structures 
uh, by the way, does anybody and the story is also in, another part of the story is interesting so this is the older guy, that's the younger guy uh, this is the supervisor who hired that guy as a student uh, and the student got the structure first uh, in fact, Max Perutz had worked on that for more than a decade. Uh, the reason why Kendrew got to the structure first, can, can anybody guess it? Maybe it was a mistake. <laughs> A mistake which leads to the right result. That's a, it's a great idea, but I mean, look at this. Look at what you see. Myoglobin Yes, myoglobin is simpler. That's the only. So he was totally lucky. Everybody believed that myoglobin and hemoglobin. Already, when you hear the words, right? Myoglobin, hemoglobin, uh, maybe similar, uh, but simply because it was simpler. That's why he got it much, much, much faster. So he essentially came as a uh, PhD student or postdoc, uh, as a postdoc in the lab and got a structure within three years and he worked on the same thing for 15 years or something like that. Uh, by the way, the other thing, is anybody noticing, looking at these two, those are the first two structures. Do you notice anything? Is there anything that jumps at you? They're all helices, exactly. Uh, and structure number three came in 1967. And it was also all helix. And then people sort of began to wonder <laughs> whether the Nobel Prize to Linus Pauling uh, on the hydrogen bond formation with beta strands was really right. It took until the 70s until somebody really saw a beta strand in a structure. Okay, so we get to, on my, my drawings here, on my images, uh, I simply can easily draw how a secondary structure looks. And there are two different ways of drawing or many different ways of drawing it. Uh, but how could I annotate secondary structure given a set of 3D coordinates? How can I get at the secondary structure with a computer algorithm? Any idea or any suggestion? So I give you, a, you all have looked at PDB, or many of you have looked at PDB files. And uh, so today in the PDB file, secondary structure is assigned. Uh, but if it wouldn't be, it's assigned in fact by a computer program that solves the problem that I'm asking you, how would you do it? Any suggestion? How, how would you assign secondary structure? Again, so what you get is the 3D information about every single coordinate. How would you assign secondary structure? Yeah? You compare the distance in the sequence in linear distance versus the distance in the 3D space. And if they're further away in the linear space, but closer together in the 3D space, then it's the same as that. Okay, so he, 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 what he says, just, just for everybody, uh, you, come, you look at the sequence, you, you look at any pair of residues, I and J, on the level of the sequence and on the level of the structure. And you say whenever I and J are closer in terms of sequence space than in terms of 3D, then it's irrelevant. Whenever they are closer in terms of 3D, so they're in contact, then sort of it reveals that they are secondary structure. This is a very interesting idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can immediately find some, some ways to, to show you that it's not always true, uh, and it still does not give you quite the... But again, so the, uh, let, me, let, me, let me phrase it differently. The idea behind here is you look... The, what I take home from this is you look at the distances between uh, residues and from the distance pattern you assign secondary structure. Yeah? What exactly is secondary structure? So, secondary structure is... I'm trying to avoid... So the question is, what exactly is secondary structure? And I'm trying to avoid the answer. Uh, because ultimately, the answer, the, if I give you a computer program, then that computer program answers that question because it defines secondary structure. Okay? Uh, the historical approach really is we see on the level of the 3D structure, we see there are macroscopic elements that stand out. Stand out means they form shapes 
but I see again and again. When I've looked at many structures, I see some repetitive pattern. That repetitive pattern I refer to as secondary structure. Because there's some macroscopic element. That's the way sort of the story evolves. That's the way we understand the structures. That's the way why we believe they are there, because they help to fold quickly. Okay? But that's not the definition of secondary structure. Now, Linus Pauling said that secondary structure happens because it's stabilized by hydrogen bonds. So then it's an energetic answer, but it's still not the answer, how do I assign helices and beta strands? Linus Pauling explained that beta strands would form I and I plus two for two strands coming together, helices I and I plus four coming together in a local, but it still does not really define what a secondary structure. Uh, but there are in fact two ways in which we could do that. So one, and I assume that, that people would go for this one first, sort of geometric description. So something that looks like a helix can essentially describe geometrically and there's a method that is called DEFINE. Uh, the later method is called DSSP and DSSP is what you have today in, in the PDB and DSSP essentially exactly looks, somehow is this idea from there, it looks at the hydrogen bonds and then it asks what type of hydrogen bond pattern do you see and assigns the, sec the major secondary structure according to the bonding type that you see. And that then defines secondary structure through that computer program. Uh, in order to define a hydrogen bond, you simply have a Coulomb energy uh, that says there's a hydrogen bond or not a hydrogen bond uh, if they are close enough to each other. Uh, and then again, you have the beta, the alpha helix, and the beta sheet. So two strands coming together. Okay, and that comes. I'm going to wrap up quickly to explain to you what comparative modeling is. So the background really is similar sequences have similar 3D structure. And by the way, by the way this is Christian Anfinsen who for that experiment that shows that the same sequence always falls into the same 3D structure uh, got the Nobel Prize in 72. Uh, or for those set of experiments, it's essentially it's a life work. Uh, let me just go through a couple of sequences here. Uh, this one happens to be a protein called Oncogene K RAS, and whoever uh, knows some Latin, oncogene is, is, is cancer related gene or protein, uh, and it happens to be called K RAS. And the slides come from Andrea Schafferhans. Now, this is a superposition of two three dimensional structures. The red one is a mutant, uh, the rainbow color is the original one, and the mutant, in fact, here is a mutant that has one residue at position 12, where a, a G changes into a C. That's all that differs between the two. You see that they are largely similar, and then here, sort of in this binding side, there is some important difference. It's important because the variant causes cancer. So this is the kind of difference in 3D that can cause a bad disease. In this particular case, uh, for KRAS, that is how KRAS first was implied with cancer. And again, so in the binding side here, you, you see some rearrangements. Now, here I have two different proteins, uh, both in human. They are both 85% uh, sequence identical. Uh, one in lime and one in green. RAS, KRAS, and RASH. And you see that essentially the binding site somehow at 85% sequence identity is still relatively similar. The structure is still relatively similar. Now we go further and we look at a fly protein, happens to call RAP6, uh, whatever. That's the uh, orange one here and you see it's still now the, the last one to the first KRAS human has only 28% sequence identity. So 70% of the residues are different. 70% of the residues, most residues, by far most residues differ, are not identical between the two, but you see that essentially the two structures look very, very similar. Even somehow the binding site still sort of looks like it can bind essentially similar molecules. Uh, so all of this somehow, well the second one is sort of in, beginning into the twilight zone, but all of this is, is still in the safe zone. So let's, let's get further into what we can only reach by 
profile, sequence profile comparisons, or profile, profile comparisons. Uh, in purple, you have now have a bacterial protein, and that bacterial protein has 19% sequence identity. But you see that actually still, the three-dimensional structure, although every, f only one in five residues are the same here between the, f the human that I started with, KRAS, and the bacterial protein in purple, only one in five residues are the same, or amino acids are the same, still the structures look very, very, very similar. Okay? And that reality is the background for doing homology modeling. But why do you believe this happens? Why, why is this the case? Well, one answer could be, well, essentially the, the sequence is such that it simply occupies the same space, or the, the energetically the, best, the most favorable position is exactly the same. And that is right. Do you believe that I could use, look at any possible mutation of one in five? Meaning that I, in the computer I can create hundreds of molecules that have 20% sequence identity to my KRAS. Will they all have the same structure? Yes or no? Who believes yes? Who believes no? Who is still awake? It's the same number. Uh, so my, it doesn't help to answer, to ask what, 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 what can I do to wake the others up? Because they are sleeping. Um, should I stop? Yes. Good. Uh, let's call it a day. Next Tuesday, there is no lecture. Uh, the next lecture will be next Thursday. I leave the floor open with a statement here. Simply say we will get into comparative modeling. Uh, so we will have a slightly different schedule than planned. Are there any other questions? Thank you for your attention. Have a good afternoon.